Love it, love it, love it. So good to see you as you guys are finding your way back to your seat after loving on each other, which is wonderful. Um, Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. As we're going to finish uh, Matthew 20 today, uh, getting going through verses 17 to the end. And uh, while you guys are finding your way there in the scriptures, let's pray and ask for God to pour out his spirit and to bless this morning. So, Father, how we thank you, Lord, for this morning. What a great time to gather, Lord, to worship you and to hear your word and to let you now minister to your flock. It is your desire to transform us. And I'm expecting that you will transform us by the power of your Holy Spirit today. Lord, make us servants. And I pray, God, you would teach us the difference in worldly greatness and heavenly greatness with the right motivation and the right heart. Lord, only, only you could do that by the power of your spirit. And so we look forward to what you're going to do this morning. We invite you to do what you want. Lord, we open up our hearts. We lay them bare before you. We are yours, God, and we give ourselves to you now waiting on our God to move and expecting you to move in a great way this morning because you are a great God and we can expect nothing less. So we thank you, Lord. We ask your blessing on our time. Pour out your spirit on your people, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, this morning, we look at greatness in heaven as compared to greatness on earth, and there's quite the contrast. Again, probably most of us would want to admit this, but God knows the truth. In us is this desire for greatness in the world. It's something that we have. Now, again, I think there can be a godly desire for greatness that's there as God changes us over the years and makes us more like him. But most of us, if not all of us, start out with an earthly desire to be great, not so much in heaven, we grow into that, but great on the earth. And how do I know that? I mean, look at childhood. We start out wanting to be the greatest athlete in school or the greatest singer or the greatest guitarist or the greatest musician or the greatest whatever, fill in the blank. We want to be the top of our class in grades or whatever the case might be. And, and then we get older and we, we transfer that to work. We want to be the best in the office or the greatest and eventually you get the seat of the CEO or whatever the case might be. And let me just say there's nothing wrong in being motivated to offer God your best. There's nothing wrong in saying, Lord, Help my life be lived as a life of excellence. I think that's expected for the believer. We should be striving to give God our all. But it's one thing to give God our all and to have an in it goal of wanting to be the greatest above everyone else. This is what the Lord's gonna deal with today in his disciples. And this is what he has to deal with in us if we're going to be used in greater measure. Now, Jesus, again, remember the setting. They're heading up to Jerusalem for him to go and die for the sins of the world. He's about to turn the keys of the kingdom over to these 12 guys. And, of course, it'll be 11 guys as Judas betrays, and then God fills that in, I believe, with Paul, but we could argue theologically over that. But either way, he's turning the keys over to his disciples who are after him, and he says, look, I want you to understand what true greatness is. I want you to have the right focus. I want you to have your mind and heart in the right place. And what the Lord knew, they didn't know at this time, your heart's in the wrong place. You guys are thinking about glory. Yes, glory is coming one day down the road, but there's a lot of hard work to do. And the example of glory is being a servant, even as I've served you. And so the Lord's gonna drive that home and try to minister to them as he gets ready to leave and go back to the Father and turn the kingdom over to these teenagers, which again, most believe these were when they called, were called were teenagers. And if that's the case, imagine the glory seeking of a teenager. Again, the mindset. Look at the teens today. You know, everybody wants to be something special or whatever. You know, a YouTube star or whatever the case might be. And God says, look, I can't use you in full capacity if your goal is to be a YouTube star. I I need you to be a star for Jesus. I need you to understand what true greatness is in the kingdom of God. So he had a lot of work to do in them. And quite frankly, he has a lot of work to do in me and he has a lot of work to do in us. And so that's what we're going to see today is the Lord working in their lives and in their hearts. Now, what's the setting? Remember, they just had this scene where the rich young ruler came to the Lord and said, you know, Lord, I want to follow you. What do I need to do to be right with God or whatever? And he said, go sell everything you have and come and follow me and you have riches in heaven. And so the rich young ruler, if you remember, he wasn't ready to do that. He couldn't give up all of his riches on earth. He was too attached to them. And so he went away in sorrow, and, and, and the, he said to the disciples how hard it is for a rich man or a rich person to go to heaven. It's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And the, the disciples were like, oh, my goodness. Then, then what rich person can be saved? Can any rich person be saved? He said, with, with, with man, that's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So the wheels start turning in Peter's head. And Peter goes, well, wait a minute. Now, if, he would have, if he'd have given all that up and he would have received great riches in heaven, well, I have given everything up. And these guys have given everything up. So, Lord, I gave everything up. We gave everything up. 
What are we gonna get? You can see where his mind is. What's our reward gonna be? And again, nothing wrong in desiring reward. It's just God's gonna need to mold it and shape it and make it the right way with the right motives. And so he says, you know, okay, you guys are gonna sit on 12 thrones with me in Jerusalem, ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. Now imagine a teenager hearing that. You tell your teen, let's get all the teens in here, high school group, come in here, and here's what's gonna happen. Every one of you are gonna be sitting on thrones here ruling the United States of America. Now let's see how well they handle that. You see what's going on here? Uh, they might want to try to seem mature. They might want to try to seem like they can handle that, but it's almost like, oh my goodness, I want to be you know, the greatest or whatever, and here we go. The disciples were no different. And so the Lord now again has to begin to mold and shape this. So their mind right now is on glory, thrones, the kingdom. Remember, they believed when the Messiah came, he was going to take over the world. He was going to rule and reign. And again, they were going to now rule and reign with him. What they didn't understand is that he had to die first, although the scriptures clearly taught that. The teachers of the day weren't teaching that. And the disciples, again, didn't really understand that he had to die for the first time. And so they're just thinking they're getting ready to go take over the kingdom. Jesus has to do a complete reboot. He's got to put new software in this whole thing. He's got to shut these guys down, realize he's going to die and be resurrected, that they have a lot to go through before they're going to get to where they need to be. And then after they serve him and after they suffer for serving him on this earth, then they'll get their thrones in glory. So you can imagine the task ahead of the Lord here. So no small task in getting his disciples where they need to be and no small task oftentimes in getting us where we need to be. See, the world has a mindset. The world has a gauge and says, look, you need to work your way up the ladder. And as I said, in the proper way, working for excellence, there's nothing wrong in that in principle. But if the goal is simply to be the greatest, we have to understand God's is exactly reversed. God says, I've got to have you work down the ladder. God says, the world is working up because of their pride trying to be great. He said, I've got to take you in your pride, Mark, and now I've got to work you back down to where you're washing feet like I did at the lowest place. And the Lord's going to mention the fact he was our example. He said, look, I'm the greatest in all the universe. I'm God in human form. What did I do? I didn't come here just to take glory. He said, I came here to save mankind and to serve mankind. And if the greatest of all the universe came to serve mankind and to minister to mankind, where does that leave us? See, that's what we're to do, to serve each other. And the beautiful thing about it is, if we do that, we will have a position of greatness in the kingdom. By the way, it's interesting to think that God says, that's what really makes you great in the kingdom. And then he tells the church, I want you to start now in your training program. This is boot camp. Start serving now. And then by the time you get to the kingdom, you'll be ready to handle that greatness. You know, it's interesting. When you look at those that are, are born into king's families, queen's families throughout history, they're trained up from children to be a king or a queen. And they know how to handle it when that responsibility comes. It's almost like people that are born into a lot of money. They grow up with money. They know how to handle money when they get older. But you take someone who's never had any money and they win the lottery. What does it last about two years? Sure, they've got a new car and a new house, but they end up going broke. And you read these stories about how it devastates people's lives because they don't understand how money works. All they know is I want it. I can spend it. I got some nice things. That's not what makes money last, right? And so for those that are raised even in king's homes, they realize I've got to be mature. I've got to handle the people in a proper way. I need to know how to present myself, if you will. Jesus is now taking a bunch of fishermen who know nothing but fishing. And he's going to make them now kings and rulers. And this is their training ground. You are also kings and rulers in God's kingdom. That's an amazing thought to think about. But even just saying that, now again, we can't let our mind go the same place Peter and the disciples did thinking about thrones. We have to realize before you're going to be ready for that in the coming kingdom, you've got to go through training. And I personally believe, although we'll be transformed into our new bodies, there is a design that God has built in here that I believe if we start learning how to serve now, take the lowest place now as Jesus did, we're going to be more prepared and ready and be placed in higher places in the kingdom because you've already gone through boot camp. So there has to be a whole retraining of the mind, whole retraining of the brain, and the Lord has to do that now with the disciples. So we take up with them now. Remember, they're traveling up to Jerusalem. They've come from the Galilee. This is the Feast of Passover. Remember, they had to go to three feasts a year. And they would travel in large entourages, large groups, large families. And, um, and so they would all go together. So there would have been a big group together, a group of the family going. Not only the large group that was with them, but even the, the crowd that was now gathering and growing following Jesus, Right? So imagine, this is a very large group of people. They've worked their way now down to Jericho. From there, they worked their way up from Jericho, a thousand feet below sea level, 
to 2,500 feet above sea level, a 3,500 foot difference, about 16, 17 miles through the desert. And believe me, it's nothing but desert. I've driven through it 12 times. It's just desert and rocks and nothing, and they have to walk the whole way up to Jerusalem. I can imagine the shape they were in. I can imagine how excited they would have been to get to Jerusalem because there's not much between Jericho and Jerusalem to get excited about. And so that's where they are in this journey, and that's where we take up here in verse 17. And notice it says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road, and he said to them, Now let's stop here for a moment. He pulls them aside by himself. Why? Remember, the crowd was with him. There was a large crowd. He didn't really care as much if the crowd understood this right now. He wanted his disciples, who he was about to turn the keys to the kingdom over, to understand this. The future kings, the future rulers. He wanted them to know, I have to first suffer before we rule and reign. Your teachers in Jerusalem have not taught you that, nor in Galilee, nor in anywhere else. But I'm going to teach you that, and you need to understand it. And what's interesting about this, he pulls them aside so he can have their undivided attention. And this is going to be the third or maybe even fourth time that the Lord has said this to them, and it doesn't register. Now, why wouldn't it register? Again, again, there's different reasons that I think the way the human mind works, you have your mind already on one outcome that's going to be there, and now you introduce a new outcome, especially something that doesn't sound very pleasant, and the mind oftentimes tends to shut that down. And all you remember is the good thing. Again, if you were a kid and your parents are about to go somewhere really fun on vacation and you can't wait, you're so excited. They say, get in the car and here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna have three flat tires. Uh, The car's gonna break down for two hours on the side of the road. We'll have to fix the, the transmission before we get there and then we'll finally get to the beach. All I heard was we're going to the beach. That's all I heard because I'm excited. My eyes are on the beach, right? So I believe it's the same phenomenon going on here with these guys. He's telling them, but it's not registering because they don't want it to register. They they can't comprehend that this could really happen because their mindset is when the Messiah comes, they were taught, he will take the world over. And that's true, but that's the second time. They were taught it would happen the first time. That's their expectation. He pulls them aside to now start again correcting this. He says, behold, and again, that word means give me your attention. Look, focus on me. I've got something very serious to say. So just Jesus and his 12, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be betrayed. I wonder how he said that. To the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death. It's kind of like, is this soaking in guys? And they'll deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. Now he tells them all the bad news up front. They're probably looking at him. We know it's not registering. What are they thinking? I don't know. Kind of this glazed donut look they've got going, right? You know? Um, and, and so look what, but look what he says lastly, and the third day he will rise again. So there's the happy part. There's the, there's the part. See, look, there is going to be great suffering. There's going to be a lot I have to go through and that you have to go through, but I'm going to rise again from the grave. And that's what he really wanted them to focus on, but they didn't grasp it. They didn't even understand he was really going to die. And I believe the Holy Spirit would have us focus on that line today as well. And what do I mean by that? Look, we have a lot of bad news going on in the world today, don't we? We have, a, a, again, our, a government that's, that's really out of control right now. We've got all kinds of world problems with wars. We've got talking about famine on the horizon. We've got talking about our economy. We've got inflation, inflation going out the roof or whatever. Again, so again, all these things that can get our mind on those things. And the Lord will says this, look, focus on this. I rose from the dead. And one day this is gonna pass. It's gonna be very soon. I'm coming back and you will rule and reign with me in the kingdom. And more than ever, I think we need to keep this focus in the days in which we live. The Lord is coming back. We're gonna rule and reign with him forever. We may have to go through a little bit of you know, hardship right now to get there, but you know what? We've got a great promise in the future. You know, it's kind of like, I guess, like my finger. You're probably staring at my finger. I should have told you this before we started, but I can use this as an illustration. What is wrong with Mark's finger? What's going on with it? Listen, I would love to say, you know, I was lifting weights. I knew I should have stopped at 495 on the bench press. Five, I thought, five more pounds, five more pounds. Snap! Oh, I messed up. No, I was drying myself off after showering. And, um, and my finger, boop, what is that? What is that? My body's going, you're getting older, man. You're getting older. I'm like, stop it. You know, anyway, but you know what? I can endure this when I realize that I'm getting a brand new one. I'm getting a new body. That's going to happen. And you know, I can go, okay, look, I may, you know, I may get my worst injury, you know, drying off with a towel or whatever the case might be. But one day I'm going to have a brand new body. I can endure this. I can handle this for now. 
And that's how we have to be about this world. There may be earthquakes. There may be some famines. There may be some death. There may be viruses. There may be illnesses. There may be governments that are just totally going wacky. But here's the bottom line. This is a short amount of time. And again, if you think, well, maybe the Lord's not going to come back in the next year. Look, even if he doesn't come back, like in in the next few years, we're going to be going to him really soon. Does everybody understand that? You only live so long. So for the Christian, we're always focused on the Lord's return or being with the Lord because even if, even if he doesn't come back right away, which I think he's going to, with all the signs that we're seeing, we're gonna be going to him and we need to be ready. And because of that, we can say, you know what, Lord, I can endure a bent finger. I can endure a crazy economy. I can endure whatever, whatever ailment you've got going right now. You know, you can endure that for a little bit longer when you realize the hope you have that's ahead. You're getting a brand new model. You're going to be with king, the king of all the universe in glory forever. You're going to be rejoicing. Just having a seven-year wedding supper of the Lamb with food in heaven that we could never even imagine and no calories? Amen. That's what I say. You know, eat whatever you want. Again, it, I'm, it, we digress. But either way. So again, he says that. They don't get it. They don't get it, but the Lord needed to tell them. And now notice, while the Lord's mind is on us and dying on the cross and all he's going to do, look where their mind is. Their mind is on greatness. And by the way, recognize this. Look at the grace with with which the Lord deals with his disciples when they've got their mind in totally fleshly places. See, this encourages me because oftentimes my mind is in totally a fleshly place. I'm not saying necessarily willful sin. Don't get me wrong. But oftentimes I'm thinking about the things of the world, you know, when I should be thinking about the things of God and God doesn't come and smack me around. God's very gracious with me. Here he is about to die. He just told them, they're gonna torture me and crucify me. They're like, I wonder which place in the kingdom I'm in, which throne I'll be in. What's, what's wrong with you? Did you not hear what I said? Is there no compassion? Is there no Lord? Can I, can I pray with you? Whatever. No, it's like, I'm worried about which throne I get, right? But notice he, deals, he never mentions it. He didn't say, you bunch of bozos. What do you, he just, he just, he immediately just goes, you know what? I'm gonna teach teachable moment. And I'm so glad he does that because again, we don't get it. And God is so gracious with us. Notice what happens. Now this is going around in their minds. They heard about the thrones. James and John, all the disciples, James and John's mom who was traveling with them. Remember, it wasn't just Jesus. It was a lot of the women that traveled with them as well. And all the families there, she heard about the thrones. They're thinking now, hey, what does that mean? Glory, what about my sons? Where will they sit? And if they sit on the throne, I'll have some glory. Hey, those are my boys, right? The parent in the stand and the guy scores the touchdown, that's my son, right? Nothing wrong in being proud of your son. But whenever our son or our daughter is getting, you know, kind of elevated, we get elevated as well, right? She's also thinking fleshly here in this sense. And notice what happens. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons. I wonder if they're kind of walking behind her like mom leading the way. I don't know. Uh, The Bible tells us they were all in it together. Another gospel doesn't even mention uh, the mother coming, just talks about James and John. So they were in this just as much. They're working as a team to get greater glory and a greater position in the kingdom of God. The, she comes with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. You can see everybody watching, all the disciples. She comes, she falls down on her knees before the Lord. Oh, how humble, how this, whatever. And yet in her supposed humility, she's gonna be seeking how great she can be, right? Now, who was this woman? This was Salome. And Salome, the Bible tells us, the mother of James and John, we have her name in another place. She traveled with the Lord. This was Mary's sister. So you can see how she would be bold to go to Jesus. This is Jesus's aunt. So she probably had much greater boldness. I can go to, you know, this is my nephew, and I watched you grow up from, you know, just from a little guy up to this, and I, you know, whatever. And so it's a, it's a big family thing going on here. So James and John were his cousin. John the Baptist was his cousin. And she decides to take this preemptive strike, if you will, not unlike many other moms that might want to promote their kids. And it can be in a healthy way sometimes. I think in this way, obviously unhealthy. And in a sense, we'll see by the language um, that she uses here in just a moment that she also is gonna be uh, focusing on the attention on herself. But before we even go on in that, and by the way, let me make this side note. You know, Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder. I think we know where they got it. The boldness that James and John had, look at their mom. I mean, she's got chutzpah. She's gonna go up and look what it says here in verse, in verse 21. What do you wish? She said, grant that these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and your left when you come in the kingdom. Jesus is the Lord of all the universe. Here's what she asked. I'm only asking that my sons could be the second, third most powerful people in the universe. What do you think about that, Lord? Is that okay? I mean, this is chutzpah, right? Now you see sons of thunder. Again, the apple didn't fall far from the tree, as they say. But before we even get into that, I want you to note this. Notice how the whole family here, God raised up the family that in Jesus' family around him to be used in ministry. I find this intriguing. 
his cousins, his aunts. We see the same thing with Moses. You had Moses. God used Moses, his brother, to be the senior pastor. Moses, his sister, Miriam, was the women's ministry leader. What is my point? Moms and dads, if you train your kids up in the Lord, God will use you as a family in ministry. Now, it doesn't always mean you're all gonna do family ministry together, you know, kind of like the Christian Partridge family or whatever, you know, and you're gonna travel around and sing whatever, this kind of thing. Sometimes that happens, right? Um, by the way, Partridge family, for some of you that are younger, I guess there's enough reruns to know what that is, but either way, um, the bottom line is, is that train your kids up and listen, you'll have children that serve in the ministry when they get older. And sometimes they may serve with you. That's a huge blessing. We see God follow that pattern throughout scripture. And I think that's an encouragement to parents. You know what? Train up your kids in the way they should go. I'll use them in ministry. And sometimes I'll even use them alongside you. So I find that extremely intriguing and also very encouraging for us as parents to raise our kids up. But notice here, I want to read that again in verse 21, because I want to kind of focus in on this. Um, notice what she says. He said to her, what do you wish? Now, again, this is interesting. Do you think Jesus knew what she wished? He knew exactly what she wished. The Lord follows this pattern throughout Scripture, and it shows us personality-wise through eternity. What is that? When Adam was in the garden, Adam, where are you? I can't find you. It's like when the kid's trying to hide, you know, and they get behind the little sprig in your house and stand real still, you know, where's Michael? Where's my? Can't find Michael. He knows. We know where Michael is, right? The Lord knew exactly where Adam was, trying to hide behind the trees, but he wanted Adam to admit it. He wanted Adam to say it for two reasons, to say exactly what was really on his heart, but also for relationship's sake. Uh, we see again here the same thing. What is it that you ask? In just a moment, when we get to the end of the chapter, we'll see the two blind men, and the Lord says the same thing. What is it that you want? He knew they wanted to be healed. So here's the bottom line. The Lord wants to hear your voice. He wants to hear the voice of his kids. Don't be afraid to ask him. Now, sometimes it's to reveal our heart so God can deal with it. And again, she was revealing her heart here that was in a wrong place. But also, it's simply relational. And, and sometimes I've heard people say, well, it's not good to ask God for, to pray for yourself because that's selfish. That's nonsense. The Bible says that we're supposed to ask, seek, and knock. Jesus, even in the garden, prayed to the Father, if this cup can pass from me. There's nothing selfish about that. It's pouring out your heart to God for your needs and what you desire. And he wants to hear your voice. And so here, I, I love it how he says, what is it that you wish? He's our, he knows, he's ready. And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. As we said, let them be the greatest in, in the kingdom of all time, if you will, uh, besides you, Lord. Let them have the greatest seat in the universe. And this is the big mistake. Here's the difference in the world's mindset and heaven's mindset. The big mistake that she made and that James and John made is they were thinking that sitting was gonna be the place where God would be the most pleased and where the most glory would be. It's not the highest seat that gets you the glory. It's what you do when God puts you in position. It is action. It is serving. And isn't that just like us? We want the highest seat at the board meeting. We want the highest position in whatever we're doing. We want the highest place. It, for the Christian, this isn't the case. We're not to be sit seating or are sitting and be seated somewhere that we're not supposed to, you know, just to take the glory from the world. We're to be men and women of action, men and women of servitude. And so the Lord now has to take her mindset from worrying about the greatest seat and saying, let me show you how to find, uh, how to wash the, you know, the, the, the greatest feet, right? Like Jesus did, getting down and washing each other's feet, the greatest, you know, picture of servanthood you could have in that day. I mean, you think of that picture. I mean, what, what, what's one of the least things you'd want to do for somebody else? Wash their feet, right? At least in that day, they wore sandals. Today, it's sneakers. Can you imagine the difference? It's bad enough with sandals, right? And so the bottom line is, is the Lord says, how much do you love your brother and sister? Are you willing to serve them even in stinky situations? You know? And so there's all kinds of applications here. And so we don't think on it too long, but either way. Notice what he says. But Jesus said to, him, said to her, you do not know what you ask. I wonder how many times the Lord has said that to me. I wonder how many times the Lord has said that to you. Lord, please, please, Lord, whatever, fill in the blank. And God goes, you have no idea what you're asking. If I did that for you, it would ruin you. If I, if I, if I did this or whatever, it would, it would take your life down a course that would take you a whole new direction. You would never be used for what I planned. You would never be used in your gifts. You'd never do whatever. And listen, here's the bottom line. God says he'll withhold no good thing from those that love him. He'll, he'll withhold no good thing. He'll give you what the best is. You pray, but then you have to trust him. Listen, I'm so thankful for the, the times that God told me no. How many of you right now are dealing with issues in your heart? You're bitter at God. 
Because you prayed for all those years and God never did fill in the blank. God never did it. And God says, if I had done that, it would have ruined you, Mark. It would have destroyed you. I could never have done that, especially when you were asking for it all that time. You don't know that, but I know that. I spared you. And when that understanding comes, it becomes, Lord, thank you. Thank you for saying no. I didn't know what I was asking. I had no idea. Now, why would the Lord say this to her? You don't know what you're asking. Listen to what he says. He says, again, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? He speaks directly to James and John. And to be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with. Understand, when you drank a cup in Scripture, the way the Bible talks about drinking a cup, it, was, it is always God's wrath. And baptism in Scripture is always immersion. It's always completely under. He's making a point. I am about to go to Jerusalem and have the wrath of God for all mankind from the beginning of eternity, well, the beginning of mankind to the end, the beginning of sin to the end, we can put it that way, poured out on me in a moment of time. I'm gonna be so immersed in the judgment of God by the sins of the world, it's gonna be like a baptism. I'm gonna be circled completely by it. It's gonna be overwhelming. I'm gonna be sweating drops of blood just thinking about it the night before. And you're asking for your sons to go and do that? Do you know what you're asking? You're saying, could your sons come and have the wrath of God poured out on them the way that I'm gonna have the wrath of God poured out on me? And notice what they say. He says, can you be baptized with this? Can you be drink this cup? And they said, we're able. They had no idea what they were saying. God, we're able to have the sins of the world poured on us. Now, if, if, if she had known what she was asking, she would have been horrified. She would have never asked this for her sins, but she didn't know. And oftentimes, again, we ask things. That's what the Lord said. You don't know what you're asking. Guys, don't be upset if God's saying no. Trust him. Trust him. When he says yes, great. You know, I rejoice as well as you guys do. When he says no, realize there's a reason that he said no. And sometimes God says wait. So listen, the wrath of God, this is something we'll never face as believers. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says we've not been appointed to wrath. We will never experience the wrath of God, ever. And, and, and again, will we experience the wrath of man? Absolutely. Will we experience the wrath of Satan? Absolutely but you will never experience the wrath of God. Jesus alone took the wrath of God and it was all poured out on him. And what he's saying is, I'm gonna take the wrath so that you, Salome, and James and John, you don't have to. And aren't you glad he did that for us? And so, but they're in their foolishness and, and, and misunderstanding, yeah, we can do this. <laughs> then again, look what Jesus said to them. You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those to whom it is prepared by my Father. Two things I want to note. Look at this. First of all, I wonder what his face changed to right here. He says, Are you, do you know what you're asking? First of all, do you realize what you're asking? I'm going to have the sins of the world poured out on me. I know you don't know what you're asking. I have to say no to this prayer. And it's for your own good because you don't know what you're asking. However, when he turned and said, and, and I just imagine this kind of reality coming over the Lord's face as he looked into their eyes with love and with seriousness, he said, you will indeed drink a cup. It won't be the wrath of God. It'll be a cup. James, Herod's going to take you, and he's going to cut your head off. We see in Acts that happen. He was the first of the 12 to be martyred. And he was taken, his head was cut off. And remember, it says that Herod did that and found out the Jews were pleased. So he went and arrested Peter. And they put Peter in jail. And the angel came and released Peter because it wasn't Peter's time to go or whatever. And he said, he, he didn't tell James what was going to happen. I'm glad he doesn't tell us that, you know. Peter, gonna, I mean, James, you're going to have your head cut off here real soon. That would have been a really sad moment for James. I'm glad he didn't know that, right? But actually, when you think about it, that was better than John because he looked at John with the same kind of face. You're going to also be baptized with a baptism you don't know. The Bible tells us, again, not the Bible, I'm sorry, outside the Bible, secular history, tells us John was boiled in oil. Interesting, James was the first martyr. John was the last. And so in a sense, the first was last, the last was first. They were the first and last, but not in the way they were thinking. And it's interesting, when John was boiled in oil, it doesn't tell us whether or not it was a Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego moment, whereas maybe they didn't really feel anything, or he didn't feel anything, or maybe he did. And I think about if he did, the scarring on his body and the pain that he felt, the Bible says he lived. God preserved him. It wasn't his time to die. But as he's writing the book of Revelation, and he's writing about the wrath of God that not only was poured out on Jesus, but will be poured out on all those who reject Jesus in the last days, I wonder if John was going, Lord, thank you for that oil. Because I would, I would much rather have been boiled in oil than to come under your wrath. Thank you that you paid for that wrath for me on the cross. And so they had no idea what their future was going to be. But compared to the wrath of God, nothing. But the reality was, yeah, it's still going to happen. And notice, 
Again, the Lord not only says that, but he also says, look, I, I don't know who's going to be on my right and my left. Now, this is amazing to me. He says, only the Father knows. But I thought Jesus was the Father. I thought they were one. They are. Isaiah 9 says that Jesus is mighty God and he is everlasting Father. Now, it's the mystery of the Trinity, how that all works, we don't know. But the reality is, that's who he is. How did he not know? And this is one of the amazing things. When the Lord left glory and took on human form, he laid aside some of the privileges of heaven. And some of those privileges were knowing everything like God did. He wasn't all knowing when he walked on the earth. He said, I don't know the day or the hour of the Son of Man's coming. He said, only the Father in heaven knows. He, he knows now because now he's back in heaven and reconnected to the Father in fullness. He didn't know this. He said, I don't know who's going to be on my right or my left. I can say this honestly. Only the Father knows. Now, when he went back to heaven, he realized, okay, now I know. And because he, he, he willfully allowed himself to be divested of that until the time came, which shows the humility that he took on, his servitude that he took on, and just shows, again, just, that, just how humble the Lord was and again, in his very character. And notice verse 24, when the 10 heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Now, you would like to think they were displeased because they're thinking, how unspiritual of James and John. They are so fleshly. I'm just really up there. No, Jesus is going to reveal they're mad because they didn't get to Jesus first. You know, they wanted their mommy to go and take them up there and say, hey, why don't you let my sons be up there and be number two and number three or whatever the case might be. So they're mad because they were thinking the same thing. We want to be on the best thrones. How come they got to you first? This isn't fair. You know, we want to be the one. It's like asking the parent if you can have the last piece of pie, right? And then mom or dad gives you the permission. And they go, like, oh, why didn't I get a piece of pie? But they asked first, right? So there's no jealousy thing going on here. And notice this, but Jesus called them to himself. Okay, time for another huddle. He had a huddle at the beginning. Guys, come in. I'm going to tell the play. We're going to run the play. Uh, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. That was the first play. Now he runs the second one. Come in. I need you to understand what heavenly greatness is. You've got your eyes in the wrong place. You've got the wrong focus. And many of us have the wrong, same wrong focus. Let's get refocused right now. What is true greatness? Listen to what he says. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. See, in the world, being the boss. That's the true greatness. Being the one that makes all the rules. Being the one that gets to say what everybody else has to do, right? That's what the world's viewpoint is. Look what he says. And those who are great, they exercise authority over them. But look what he says. I love this. But, and he says, yet it shall not be so among you. Here's the statement to his followers. The world's going to do it that way. You have to do it different. You're not going to work your way up the ladder in the kingdom. You're going to work your way down to people's feet. And you're going to wash them. And you're going to serve. And if you do that, like I did, because I'm setting the, setting the example, you'll be great in the kingdom of God. It's, it's a total reversal. He says, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. We'll come back to that. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Look, I came to die for the world, but I also came to serve the world. I'm God of the universe. If I came to give my life and serve the world, where does that leave you, disciples? Where does that leave us this morning? We're supposed to be servants. And so whenever we're seeking our own glory, our own position, our own whatever with the wrong motives, then we're thinking like the enemy thinks. We're not thinking, listen, we're never the most like Satan in, except when we have this kind of attitude. What did Satan say in the kingdom? I will be like God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to go to the highest seat. I'm going to go to the highest place. God said, no, you don't understand Satan what I'm like. You think because I'm at the highest place that that's what I'm, he says, no, I'm going to go to the lowest place. I'll show you what I'm like. I'm going to go to the earth as a man. I'm even going to lay down some of my privileges of, my, of, of, of the, the, the Trinity, if you will. I'm going to go down, I'm going to serve mankind. I'm going to die for mankind. You've got it so backwards. And because of that Satan, you're going to be thrown to the lowest place of hell. And whenever we start trying to find the highest place or seek the highest place, that's the mark of the enemy. That's the mark of the flesh. It's, it's both of those, actually. But he says, you want to be great? You need to be a servant. You need to be a slave. And you need to look like I do and the way that I serve. Emulate me. Imitate me. Now, it's interesting here. I want you to note two things here about the words um, servant, uh, great and servant, and first and slave. And I think there's something very significant the Lord is pointing out. First of all, what is a servant? He says, you want to be great, be a servant. It's the word diokonia. It's where we get the word deacon. And listen to what it literally means. And I quote, to wait on others and care for their needs, to place the needs and comfort of someone else above our own in active work and service. Note this, not the best seat, but active work and service. It means, you know what, you may have to put someone in a position that you could take that would be more comfortable, 
but you're going to give it to them because you're going to serve them. See, that's a work of the Spirit. That's a work of humility. Maybe it's a, a long trip and you've got the best ticket. You've got a great seat and you see someone that's really struggling and maybe they've got some kind of handicap and they're really in an awkward place, maybe on the flight or in, in, in whatever the, the vehicle or whatever you're traveling in. And you said, why don't you sit over here? Because you know that it's going to be better for them. But you realize this is like a 13-hour trip and I just made myself miserable. That's the heart of Christ. That's the heart of Christ. That doesn't come by natural means. That's supernatural means. But he said, if you can tap into the spirit and become that kind of man and become that kind of woman, you're going to be great in the kingdom of God. Why? Not because you're earning something, but because you're going to be more like me. And I'm the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And I lay myself down for others. I lay myself down for mankind. So you want to be great in the kingdom? Be a servant. So we serve each other if we're looking to be great. Notice the second thing, and I see a division here, almost like another layer, if you will. The overall picture is servanthood. I get that. But notice, it's almost as if the Lord is making a point that there's even a higher place. Look at verse 27. Whoever desires to be first, that is, you want to be great, that's one thing. But you want to be first, you're asking to be on my right and my left. You want to be first? (laughs) Be a slave. You see your fellow disciples? Don't just serve them, be their slave. Wow. Then you'll earn seat two, seat three. And I say earn, I say that in the world's mindset, not really what, what, what God, the heart God would have us to have, but you get my point. He's saying, serve each other. Being a slave. Now, we think about slavery in the world's context. That is not a good, it's not a good look. And that's not what God's talking about. He's not, he's not talking about taking someone by force, taking their life away from them to be your slave. He's saying, no, to be a slave the way I was for mankind, to lay your life down. Listen to the definition of dulio, which is what this word is. It means, and I quote, to completely and absolutely assign all personal rights over to the authority and will of another and to be in permanent, a permanent relationship of slavery. This is not the kind of slavery where you're taken captive beyond your will and, and abused. This is something where you say, I willingly give myself to be your slave and to serve you because you're my brother, you're my sister. Paul said this about his relationship to God. He said, I'm a doulos to God. I'm a willing slave to the Lord. I want to serve God. I want to be his complete slave. Because what a great prayer to pray, but what a hard one to pray. It's hard to go to God and say, you know what, God, I I don't have it in me to be the servant I need to be. I don't have it in me to be a complete slave of yours. And by the way, this is so hard for our mindset. Break out of earthly slavery. This is a glorious thing. This is the thing that comes with great reward. It's giving our life up where we find life. So it's actually you're going to find more life, more joy, more fulfillment by becoming a slave of the Lord. But our mind doesn't work that way. But it's almost like going to the Lord and saying, make me this slave of yours. That's even a hard prayer to pray. Because we can kind of worry and go, well, what do I have to give up? What's going to happen? Listen, I encourage you to do this. Pray that prayer, but say, God, you're going to have to give me the ability to be the the servant and the slave you want me to be to others and to you. That's my desire, but it's not my fleshly nature. My fleshly nature is to have other people serve me. And Lord, I need you to change me. God, if you pray that from your heart and you mean it, God will help you do that. God will answer that prayer. And so I love what he shows them. That's the proper way. Now you know what greatness in the kingdom of heaven is. And now we see this final scene where he shifts gears and, he's, and we finish up with chapter 20. It is kind of a change of gears, but I want to wrap this up with this so we'll be ready to start at 21 next week. Now he comes to the two blind men. Look at verse 29. It says, Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him, and behold, two blind men sitting by the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out and said, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. What a sentence that is. Let me tell you why that's so amazing. Number one, Son of David, that was a term that was specifically used for the Messiah. It's a biblical term for the Messiah. In other words, they were saying, we recognize you are the Messiah. Do you realize the majority of people did not yet recognize him as the Messiah? His disciples recognized him as the Messiah, but the majority of of the world, the majority of Israel at that time, they had no idea he was the Messiah. They didn't even believe he was the Messiah. And yet these two blind men can see that he's the Messiah. Again, oftentimes, guys, insight is much greater greater than eyesight. And God had opened their eyes. They felt the light of God come into their aura, their their realm. Here comes the light of God. And their spiritual eyes picked up on it. They realized, this is the Messiah. This is the son of David. We've heard about him. We now sense the presence of God and his glory. And they cry out, you are the Messiah. This would have gotten everyone's attention because people weren't publicly declaring Jesus as the Messiah. That didn't even happen until he rode into Jerusalem. We'll see next week. So no doubt the crowd turned and looked like, what are you guys doing? You're saying he's the Messiah? 
I'm sure nobody was mad at him, but it's kind of like, what? Messiah? He's a great leader, great prophet. You're saying he's the Messiah? Secondly, listen, it shows their faith. Because to say that, the Sadducees and Pharisees, they said, if anybody declares that Jesus is the Messiah, we're kicking you out of the culture, out of society. You can't get a job. You can't go to synagogue. Your life in Israel is over. And they could do that. They had the authority to do that. They completely rejected anyone that recognized him as the Messiah. So they're not only seeing things others don't see, they're saying, we're willing to lay it all down and lose everything for you, Lord. See, this is the kind of heart God's looking for. Willing to lay everything down. And by the way, I guess, you know, you're blind. There's not a lot to lose, right? You, know, you want your eyesight? What else is there to lose? And so then it says, the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. Say, so stop bothering the Lord. He's a busy man, Right? I love this, but they cried out all the more saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David, Messiah, have mercy. He's like, you know, when you want to get to Jesus bad enough, nobody can stop you. And nobody can stop these guys. And so the Lord hears this. Everyone hears it. It's quite the stir and for a number of reasons, as we noted. And notice verse 32. So Jesus stood still. I think that'd be a great place for a period. Why? Guys, how many of our prayers make Jesus stand still? I wonder how many prayers I've prayed that the Lord goes, you didn't mean that at all. That was so, that wasn't heartfelt. You're just going through the motions. You see, oftentimes these groups of people that don't know the Lord, they're, they're unbelievers, but they get in a group because something bad happens. They say, let's say the Lord's Prayer, you know. And they say it in this kind of real rote, you know, kind of way. And you tell that that doesn't really mean anything to them. I remember being invited to some, some friends of ours. They were Jewish and they didn't know the Lord. Uh, but we loved them, and they invited us. We got to go see what a Sabbath was like and be there. And I watched the husband of the home just go through all these prayers they do in such a rote, meaningless way. It's just like, I'm going, you're missing so much. Do you realize the heritage that you have? Your father's Abraham. The Messiah was promised through your people. He's given you Jerusalem forever as your capital eternally. He's got a future for your nation. You're going to be revived. And you're going, <laughs> you should be going, oh God, thank you. Thank you for what you've let me be a part of. Listen, I'm not in that heritage, but I'm in the heritage of the saved of God. And I'm like, God, thank you for saving me. I look around at people that aren't saved. And yes, I want to see them come in the kingdom, but I'm very thankful that I'm saved. I look at family members that don't know the Lord and I say, God, thank you that you saved me. I don't know why you did it, but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There has to be an understanding and that's the kind of heart where God stands still. If you need the Lord this morning and you really have something from your heart, you're crying out, he will stand still. He will hear your prayer and he'll answer it. Don't, it's, it's not that he doesn't hear your prayer, but it moves him. He stops in his tracks. Who said that? It's almost like in all this room, all these people that are here, some of you pray prayers that have more passion than others. And the Lord says, I know who said that. I heard that over there. Oh, I heard that. I heard that just then. Because I see your heart. That's exactly what's happening here. He stands still. They've got the Lord's attention. That's where you want to be. And he called them. And again, when, again, when God hears our prayer, he calls us to him. He's calling some of you to him right now. Because you're hearing that and you're crying out to him. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? Again, he knew exactly what it was. You know, they, they wanted their sight. He wanted them to say it. He wanted to hear it from them, verbalize it. And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. Yes, you have not because you asked not, but now you've asked. And I was wanting to do this and I hear your faith and I see your faith and I feel your faith. You reached my heart. It's coming from your heart and that grabbed me. And look what it says. So Jesus had compassion and he touched their eyes. So you see him just reaching out, laying his hands on their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. And that's always what happens when the Lord opens our eyes in compassion to who he is, we begin to follow. And you know what? The Lord is opening some of your eyes this morning. Now it might be that some of your eyes are open for the first time to salvation, that you realize Jesus is the Messiah, just like these blind men, son of David. I recognize you're the Messiah. Maybe God's opening your eyes right now and he's saying, follow me, follow me. But it might also be that for the first time, God's opening some of your eyes to what true greatness is in heaven, servitude, servanthood, servitude, serving the Lord, serving each other, putting others before yourself and not just understanding it mentally. We know that in our brain. We hear that growing up in church, right? What about in the heart? What about saying, God, show me, how can I serve the people at Calvary Chapel? How can I serve believers around the world? How can I serve Knoxville? What can I do, Lord, to be a servant? And God's doing that in your heart as well. He's opening your eyes to see that. Respond to him. We're about to pray. And for some of you that maybe God is opening your eyes, he's saying, respond to me and follow me. 
Maybe first time commitment. Others of you, he's saying, hey, you've, you've heard me. Respond to me. Step out and start serving. But I don't know where to serve. Serve anywhere. Just start serving. And the Lord says, I'll show you from there where to serve. Start serving and follow me because I'm a servant. And I gave you the example of servitude. Guys, don't, don't fight the Lord. Give in. Follow him. You're not going to regret any of this on judgment day. When we stand before the Lord, not judge for our sins, but on the day of rewards, you're going to be so glad you did this. You're going to be so glad. Lord, I'm so glad that I listened to your voice and I understood it and I put it into action. And I want to pray right now that God would help all of us to do it. Let's pray. Lord, I want to just right now, again, thank you, Father, for what you're doing this morning and working in our hearts. And God, for those in here, maybe for the first time this morning, their eyes have been opened. Lord, like those blind men by the road, you are the son of David. You are the Messiah, Ben David. You are the Savior of the world. And Lord, as you hear them crying out right now, saying, Lord, save me. What, Lord, you're asking them probably, what do you want? Lord, they want to be saved. As, as people in this room cry out that want to be saved, God, as they begin to confess their sins and ask forgiveness, and I encourage you to do that. If you're hearing the Lord's voice this morning and understanding for the first time he's your Savior, ask his forgiveness. Confess your sins to him. And give him your life. Tell him you believe he died for you. And give him your life. He's calling you to follow him. Follow him. Don't just sit there any longer. It's not about sitting. It's about following. It's action. And Lord, for those in here this morning that maybe for the first time, you've really driven down into our hearts what it means to be a servant. It's washing the feet of others. It's laying ourselves down for the comfort of others in action and in deed. Lord, living the way you lived, laying ourselves down, becoming a slave, becoming a servant of the God most high and, and all those around us in the kingdom. And Lord, in some mysterious way, Lord, you've allowed us to be great through that. Father, you're so good. Just do your work through your spirit. And we thank you, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One last thing I want to say before we're done. And I wish I had said this during the teaching because they may have already cut off the streaming, but you may never be the world's greatest athlete. Probably won't be. There's probably not a Michael Jordan in here or a Michael Jackson or whatever else as far as what the world sees as the best of the best at what they do. But God is, no matter what abilities you have or lack thereof, he has given every single person here and everyone hearing my voice the ability to be the greatest in the kingdom of God and that's not just temporary, that's forever. Is that exciting or what? Every one of you can be the greatest in the kingdom. There's nothing limiting you. It's only this. Be a servant. Be a servant. Be a slave for each other. And you will be the Michael Jordan of heaven. Right? When the rapture happens, air whatever. Right? God bless you guys. Have a great afternoon, the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord.